Well, good morning. Uh, we're going to go ahead and, and link on right now, and hopefully people will start to join us, but we just want to make sure that if they get on at 930 that they see that something's actually going on here. Again, uh, we need to apologize uh, for the weather, although we have no control over the weather. But um, generally speaking, if we have had a lot of snow, we go ahead and continue to meet and have church anyway. The issue is the freezing rain, and uh, we've had it. We had it again during the night, and a whole band is on its way, uh, according to the satellite map that's supposed to get here soon. And uh, for those of you who were at Ivy Lee's memorial on Wednesday, unfortunately, we got the freezing rain and, and sleet uh, during her service, and as a result, it was hard for people to get out of the church and to their vehicles. So we we don't want that to be repeated. We're not the only church, I guess, in town that has canceled services today. So what we're doing is, since we do have Facebook Live, we're going to do Sunday School, and then later on at 11, uh, we're going to link on for the worship time. I'll explain at that time what <clears throat> all we're going to do. But uh, again, if you know of people who want to see this and who are not on Facebook, after this is all over, Trudy is going to download these to YouTube, and they could go to YouTube and watch them as, as well. Again, this is a lot different than it used to be. It used to be if we had to cancel a service, it was done, period. But this way we can at least do something. Now, when it comes to Facebook Live and it comes to the adult Sunday school time, if you do have a comment or a question, if you type it in, it'll appear on Trudy's phone, and then Trudy could read the comment or the question to me, and I could try to respond. But I won't hear your questions, I won't see your questions, it'll only appear on, on Trudy's screen. So it's just about uh, 9.30, and again, I want to apologize, you may hear my phone go off, uh, I'm going to use my phone for the audio for the Bible, and so I can't turn my ringer off. And I have no idea if people are going to try to call or text or anything else. So if you do hear my phone, again, this is just an anomaly today, and we're trying to work this whole thing out. If you haven't already figured it out, I'm not at the church. I'm at home, and uh, again, we're trying not to go anywhere today either uh, because of, of the weather. So it's right about 9.30. I do just want to mention some prayer requests and some updates uh, since we met. And maybe, of course, you don't have the bulletin, so you can't see what's printed there. One is that uh, Elsie Wood did pass away this week. Uh, many of you knew Elsie. Uh, she and George were Alliance missionaries in Vietnam and then in Thailand for many years. Uh, we had them many times at our church because Elsie grew up in Walla Walla. So they spent their furlough in Walla Walla several times. Their son Mike went to high school here. And of course now Mike and Wendy are alliance workers uh, in Thailand uh, through marketplace ministries. Anyway, George passed away a couple years ago and Elsie had had Parkinson's for years. She was on hospice. And so the family is actually relieved. She was ready to meet Jesus. So anyway, please be praying for them during this period of time. Please can pray for Carolyn Lesseur. Uh, again, to my knowledge, uh, they have not received any reports back from the biopsy, but they're home. They're trying to stay warm and dry, and she has appointments coming up this week for them to make decisions about her care. So please be praying for her. Also, some of you have heard about Mary Ann, who is Patty's daughter, and uh, due to her radiation, apparently developed a heart problem that caused a heart attack. So she uh, had a stent put in this week and seems to be doing much better, but continue to be praying for her. Uh, again, all the other prayer requests are in the bulletin already, and you've had it in the past, and uh, so I don't really have any new updates on those. We did have the memorial service for Ivy Lee Lauder <coughs> this week, so please continue to be praying for her family and for um, Fred. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm not sick. But all of these heaters that are running during this really cold weather have affected my sinuses, and so I get this post-nasal drip, and of course it uh, becomes worse when I try to talk. So if I have to clear my throat or blow my nose, it's uh, simply um, 
my sinuses are just being bothered by everything that's, that's going on right now. So uh, let's just have a word of prayer, and then uh, we're going to attempt uh, to do a, uh, at least a version of our Sunday School. Father God, we thank you for your love, and again, we thank you for all of these requests that have, we have brought before you. Father, we lift them up to you, knowing that you care, and we just pray that you would work in each and every life, each and every family, in such a way that Jesus would be glorified. For it's in his name we ask it. Amen. All right. So, if you are following along at home, and you have your Bibles, we're going to start in Psalm 90. Uh, if you have your uh, study guide, we are going to uh, start in uh, lesson number 8. And that's where we uh, plan to be this morning, lesson number eight. So if we were uh, at the church, and if Mark Sutherland was uh, running the audio, we could start and stop quite easily uh, based on the different verses we were covering. But since I'm trying to do all this myself, uh, what we plan to do is uh, just go ahead and, and play the psalm all the way through. And then we'll go back and we'll talk about different sections. So, was there a question or a comment? No? Okay. Just wanted to make sure. Yeah, yeah, excuse me while I break my nose. And we're going to go to Psalm 90. And Psalm 90 is known as a prayer of Moses. Not David, but Moses. Now, if this is indeed the case, which we believe it is, this potentially makes Psalm 90 the oldest of all of the, of the Psalms. So, uh, I'm going to go ahead and play Psalm 90 in its entirety, and then we'll go back and we'll take a look at it. Psalm 90, a prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, wherever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn man to destruction and say, Return, O children of men. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, and like a watch in the night. You carry them away like a flood. They are like a sleep. In the morning, they are like grass which grows up. In the morning, it flourishes and grows up. In the evening, it is cut down and withers. For we have been consumed by your anger and by your wrath. We are terrified. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your countenance. For all our days have passed away in your wrath. We finish our years like a sigh. The days of our lives are 70 years, and if by reason of strength they are 80 years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow. For it is soon cut off, and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger? For as the fear of you, so is your wrath. So. Teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Return, O oh Lord. How long? And have compassion on your servants. Oh, satisfy us early with your mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days make us glad according to the days in which you have afflicted us the years in which we have seen evil let your work appear to your servants and your glory to their children and let the beauty 
of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Okay, so that is Psalm 90 in its entirety. Again, this is attributed to Moses and appears to be the oldest of the Psalms. It may have been composed during the wilderness wanderings of the Hebrews, perhaps after nearly the whole of a generation had perished for the rebellion against the Lord. Again, remember, they wandered for 40 years. It says, Though God gave Canaan to the Hebrews as their homeland, he himself remained their dwelling place. Dwelling place, in this instance, refers to a protecting shelter. True security is not found in a place, but in a person. I think that's very important. Not a place, but a person. Though our circumstances may fluctuate like the stock market, God remains life's most dependable constant. Though every change, through every change, he is faithful, the one to whom we may ever turn for strength and encouragement. So the interesting thing is, it goes on to say that as his people's dwelling place, God is eternal. And so that's one of the themes of this song, is the eternality of God and the transient nature of man. God is eternal, man is not. He has existed since before he created the mountains and the whole world. And the Hebrew word for world is a poetic synonym for earth, means that the productive part of the earth. The creator of all the world exists unchanged from everlasting to everlasting. And that's an important component when we consider theology, <clears throat> is God is not a changing um, being. It's not that uh, he's evolving over time or <clears throat> changing his, uh, his ways. He is from everlasting to everlasting. After establishing God's perpetual existence, the psalmist contrasted it with the transient nature of human life. He made his point in several ways. First, he alluded to Genesis 3.19, excuse me, by saying that all people, literally weak men or mortals, must return to dust. I heard about a little boy who was crying in bed, and his parents went in to see what was wrong. And he said, well, that's what the preacher said in church today. And parents said, well, what did the preacher say? Well, from dust we have come, to dust we will return. And there's somebody coming or going under my bed, I don't know which. So, dust, yes. Second, he said that to God, a millennium is like a day or even like the four-hour watch in the night. I think that we need to be careful <clears throat> because, again, this is a, uh, an analogy. Uh, some people want to say, well, every time a day is mentioned in the Bible, that's obviously a thousand years because a thousand years to the Lord is, is a day. I, I think that the whole idea here... <clears throat> is that Moses is drawing this analogy to say because God is eternal, <clears throat> because he exists outside of time, <clears throat> he is not affected like by time like you and I. Can you imagine that? Dealing with a being who does not who is not controlled by time. We live in the space time continuum. We measure everything by a start or a stop. We measure everything by its, its height, its width, its depth. But God is eternal and is not controlled by that. So this means that God looks at time in a different way than we do. Third, the psalmist said that the human journey through life to death is like being swept away in a flood. And of course, uh, in those days, people knew exactly what a flood was like. When I was in Israel, we had a chance to go down the Wadi Kelt uh, from uh, Jerusalem to uh, Jericho. It was a back road, very, very steep, very windy, and very dry. But when there's a rainstorm in Jerusalem, oftentimes the Wadi Kelt rages with water because all that water floods down that. 
and uh, then is gone. And of course, uh, that is what the human life is like. As if the shortness of human life were not bad enough, Psalm 90 points out <clears throat> that the years that we do get in life are filled with trouble and sorrow. If you have your study guide on the bottom of page 64, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a box entitled Lifespans. According to the Old Testament history, people lived much longer in ancient times than they do today. Before the flood, lifespans often approached a thousand years. Adam lived 930. One of his descendants, Methuselah, lived 969 years. After the flood, the average lifespan steadily decreased. Noah's son Shem lived 500, but Abraham's father Terah lived just 205, while Abraham himself lived 175, and Joseph lived 110. Moses lived 120 years, but apparently by his time, somewhere between 1520 and 1400 BC, such an advanced age was unusual. The average lifespan had dropped to about 70 or 80 years, according to Psalm 90, verse 10, and there it has remained. So again, for those people who do not believe in a worldwide flood, I believe that the human lifespan uh, is indicative that truly uh, our planet has changed, our atmosphere has changed, and that's one of the reasons why uh, we don't have the lifespans they had before the flood took place. <clears throat> so why should human beings who are made in the image of God be reduced to such a state? Well, of course, according to the psalm, sin is the case. God's judgment is the case. And of course, if you go all the way back to the book of Genesis, which we have been reading now uh, in our Through the Bible reading, uh, you'll see that Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden uh, because of their sin. God did not want them to stay in the garden, to eat of the tree of life, and to perpetually live in the state of sin. So uh, the psalm also talks about our iniquities and our secret sins. Uh, by the way, Adam blamed Eve for his sin, and Eve blamed the serpent. But again, we have no one else to blame but ourselves. The first part of the psalm concludes with verses 11 and 12. These verses say, We cannot measure God's anger, but should try to measure our lifetime. And so that's a good challenge. All right, again, because we played the psalm all the way through, we're now going to go to point B, if you are following your study guide, and we're now on page 65. And we're going to talk about the source of joy and gladness. Uh, the key verses that are listed there, by the way, are verses 14 and 15. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. The final part of Psalm 90 is a plea for mercy. Because the people had a pitiable existence in the wilderness, Moses, on their behalf, begged God for compassion. The Hebrew word translated relent in verse 13 literally means turn. Moses was asking God to reverse his attitude towards the Hebrews. Moses could make such a plea because he knew God is not only wrathful, he is also compassionate. So you remember the time when, when God told uh, Moses, stand back, and I'm going to just wipe these people out. And Moses goes and intercedes for the people of Israel and, and pleads uh, his case. And God does not destroy the people of Israel. <clears throat> I believe this was to show Moses the grace of God. <clears throat> I'm sorry, you know, before I started talking, I wasn't all clogged up. But as soon as I started talking, I get this post-nasal drip. To Moses, the period of judgment had seemed like night. So he asked for a dawn of compassion. God's unfailing love was his love for his covenant people. The psalmist believed that if the Hebrews could get a firm grasp on his love, they would experience joy and gladness. Specifically, Moses requested for the people an amount of blessing equal to their previous 
suffering. And again, they had spent 400 years in Egypt and spent most of those years as slaves uh, in the land of Egypt. If you've been doing your through the Bible reading, uh, we have just now gotten to the point where Moses, oh, excuse me, where um, Joseph is uh, confronting his brothers and has convinced them to bring Benjamin down to Egypt. As you know, eventually Jacob comes to Egypt as well, and that's where they stay for 400 years. But anyway, that's how that story got going. Furthermore, Moses asked God to perform miraculous deeds for the present and future generations. Um, by the way, on page 66 of your study guide, there is a little box entitled 70 and 80 Numbers in Hebrew's Poetry. Hebrew poets had a way of using parallel numbers to represent an estimated or indeterminate amount. Two examples of this technique are contained in this lesson, Psalms. Among the many other Old Testament examples of this technique are those in 1 Samuel 18, Proverbs 30, and Amos 1. So when Moses says, our lifespan is 70, maybe 80 years, this is a poetic device used in Hebrew. So uh, he prays, and uh, of course, they need to be reminded that in the past, God has protected them. So just as he parted the Red Sea, then when they get to the Jordan River, he parts the Jordan River. Finally, Moses asked for God's favor, and God would show his favor. Moses suggested if he would establish the work of our hands. The repetition of, repetition of this prayer is a signal of its importance. Success in any endeavor comes from God. Without his blessing, all human efforts are futile. So we need to be remembered by that. Okay, so that is Psalm 90, a very, very beautiful psalm, uh, a psalm that is a favorite of, of many people. But now we're going to go to Psalm 91, and Psalm 91, uh, according to my Bible, is not attributed to any particular author. So, if you could give me just a second, we're going to call up our audio Bible again and move over to Psalm 91. And again, I'm going to play the entire psalm, and then we'll go back and we'll talk about it. Psalm 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you, to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra. The young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Some of you remember Chaplain 
As I say, Mark says we have a bomb shelter made of feathers. A bomb shelter made of feathers. Okay, right. So, yeah, we're going to talk about that in just a moment uh, because I believe that this is one of those cases where God is compared to uh, uh, a creature. I don't think God actually has feathers or wings, but we are protected by his feathers. Okay, excuse me. <coughs> I think that candle is what's getting to my nose. We have a candle burning here in our... In our dining room. I mean, it smells really good. But I think it's one of the things that is... I must be allergic to it. Excuse me. Anyway, um, Psalm 91, Ben Baker's, during World War II, as you know, was a tail gunner. Excuse me. Tail gunner on a B-24 bomber. And uh, his mother was very concerned about him. And so she sent him Psalm 91 uh, as a word of encouragement. And uh, Ben has a list of all of his missions uh, over Germany and over Austria. And he has Psalm 91 recorded as a promise during that period of time. All right. So let's take a look at Psalm 91. And uh, if you take a look at your page uh, 66 of your study guide, it's entitled Guarded by God. And uh, the key verses there are verses 1 and 2. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. So, this is a favorite psalm of many, many people. Here is a psalm for our seasons of danger when physical or spiritual well-being seems at risk. Again, uh, this is an anon anonymous psalm. We're not sure exactly who wrote it. This psalm may have been used in temple worship to assure worshipers of their security in God. Verses 1 and 2 state the psalm's major lesson. Those who seek God's protection find it. These verses use four names for God. Now again, we're going to take a look at the English translations. And so if you were able to study the original Hebrew, perhaps there's even more significance. <clears throat> but these names are translated the Most High, the Almighty, the Lord, and God. These verses also use comparisons for God's protection. God is like a shelter or a secure hiding place from storms or wild beasts. God is like the shadow or shade from a tree that protects the person at the midday sun. God is like a refuge and a fortress, places where people could escape their enemies. So again, whenever scripture says God is like, <clears throat> again, it's an analogy for us to try to be able to understand in human terms how God relates to us. Now, in verses 3 through 8, the psalmist used two dangers, war and disease, to represent dangers in which God protects his people. Both representative dangers are introduced in verse 3. The fowler's snare is a bird trap, and it stands for an ambush of an unexpected strike from enemies. <clears throat> the deadly pestilence refers to the epidemics that periodically eradicated ancient societies. You and I have just been through COVID. <clears throat> now they are warning us that virus X is out there on the horizon. They don't know what virus X is yet, but they say that it could be 20 times deadlier than COVID. Again, that causes a lot of debate. How do they know that there is something, even though it hasn't actually appeared yet? But anyway... God does not always protect his people from such dangers as war and disease, but he can protect us and frequently does protect us. Therefore, when dangers threaten, we can know that we are not alone. So that is the key. We are not alone. Doesn't mean that war won't take place, doesn't mean that disease won't take place, but we are not alone. 
So in general terms, the psalmist said God shelters his own as tenderly as a mother bird shelters her young. At the same time, his faithfulness is strong, like a shield or a rampart. The word translated rampart may refer to uh, armor or to a kind of shield. So, many of you are aware that the Mormon Church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, has a false doctrine of God. They believe that God was a man, just like you and me, and exalted himself to Godhood. And just as he did, so can we. And they would use as examples in Scripture where it talks about God's voice, or God's hand, or his arm, etc. Well, again, these are what we refer to as anthropomorphisms. In other words, we use a human trait to try to describe the nature of God. So, the argument against the Mormon theology would be, well, if that's the case, then God must also be a bird, because here it talks about his wings, and it talks about his feathers. But again, we know that's true. God is spirit, and so these are different ways that God protects us. And verse 3 uh, re repeats the idea that God can protect his people from war, whether it come by night or by day. Then verse 6 repeats the idea that God protects his people from disease, whether they infect a, uh, a victim after dark or during the daylight hours. God can protect his people from such dangers at all times. This part of the psalm winds up with the image of a godly person surviving an episode of danger, probably a battle, though thousands die all around. This person not only survives, but also observes a total victory over enemies. God is able to protect his people from even the worst dangers, and his protection is not partial, but complete. If this were a Psalm of David, I'm not saying that it is, <clears throat> if it were a Psalm of David, David obviously went into battle many times and came out alive when he saw many, many people drop uh, during the battle. So that could be a possibility. While well, Psalm 91 is enthusiastic about God's protection, we should not take it to mean that all harm will never reach the people of God. In other words, we still live in this life. We're still affected by life. So, for instance, uh, when storms come through, like ice storms, we're affected just like everybody else. Uh, when earthquakes or other natural disasters happen, we are affected. But that doesn't mean that God is not able to rescue his people. The psalm can also remind us that while evil may wound or wound or harm believers and even destroy our lives in this world, we still possess eternal hope in Christ Jesus. So that should be an encouragement. All right, so now to point D on page 68 of your study guide, the promises of his presence. And the key verses there are verses 14 through 16. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. So the second half of Psalm 91 has a two-verse introduction, just like the first half. And like verses 1 and 2, verses 9 and 10, teach us that those who truly see God's protection find it. <clears throat> so both of these halves have that parallel to them. The psalmist then pointed out, one means by which God has protected his people. He has sent angels to intervene. Now, <clears throat> just a word about angels. It seems like uh, back in the 90s, or somewhere around that period of time, there was almost an overemphasis upon angels, or even TV shows about angels. And 
I am not saying that God does not use angels uh, in his economy. But we should not worship angels. We should worship the Lord. And that tended to be the, the uh, theme of these, um, these TV programs, is how important the angels were. It's worth noting, by the way, that when Satan tempted Jesus, he misapplied this very passage. And I'd encourage you to go back and read Mark chapter 4 or Luke chapter 4 and read about the different temptations of Jesus. Because Satan comes and actually uses God's word against Jesus. He misinterprets it. He misquotes it. And that's what the Psalms, I mean, the, the uh, cults do today. That's what some of these TV preachers do today, who take God's word and they take it totally out of context and they misapply it. And so this is what Satan was trying to do. Uh, basically, you know, he was saying, go ahead. Satan, I mean, and Satan said, go ahead and jump, because the Lord's going to protect you. His angels will keep you from falling. And uh, again, Jesus responds. With verse 14, a change in voice occurs. Now we hear God promising to bless a person who trusts in him. By the way, over on page 69, there is a box entitled Angels, and I will read that for you. We were at the church in Sunday school. Uh, you would be bailing me out on all of these. Drawing on the many biblical references to angels, we can piece together a partial description of them. Angels are supernatural beings whom God created before he created humans. They possess some of the divine characteristics such as spiritual forms and some human characteristics such as limited knowledge. Angels live in heaven. But sometimes God would use them on earth to communicate his messages to humans. Often when angels appeared on earth, they would look human. God also sent them uh, to humans to announce, to warn, to guide, to announce, uh, to instruct, to guard, to, and defend, to minister, and to carry out God's judgment. When we read the book of Revelation, of course, we see the angels then coming uh, as ministers of his justice on earth. So according to this psalm, the trusting person has three characteristics. First, he loves the Lord. Verse 14. That is, he clings to the Lord as a child clings to a parent. Second, he acknowledges the Lord's name. Since to Israelites a person's name stood for his or her character. This means the trusting person recognizes God's unique nature. And third, he calls on the Lord in times of trouble. So when problems arise, the person who has faith in the Lord calls upon him. The blessing upon the trusting person has eight characteristics. Let's take a look at those. The Lord will rescue him or get him out of his troubles. The Lord will protect him from danger. The Lord will answer his prayers positively. The Lord will be with him in trouble to help him through it. The Lord will deliver him from his problems, thereby bringing honor to him from others. The Lord will satisfy him with long life, a sign of divine favor. Lastly, the Lord will show him salvation, which can mean deliverance from either physical or spiritual evil. One of the things that uh, we've learned from uh, the Greece Evangelical Society and uh, Bob Wilkin is that you need to take a look at the word salvation in context, because sometimes it does mean spiritual salvation. We are saved from our sins. We are guaranteed a place with the Lord in the future. But other times, salvation can mean uh, protection from earthly issues. So we need to take a look at that. All right, the picture of God's protection could hardly be more comprehensive than Psalm 91 presents it. All right, so let's take a look now, very briefly, at Psalms in brief 92 through 100. 
So if you have your study guide and you're on page 70, I'm simply going to read the Psalms in brief. Again, because we have a limited time frame during this winter quarter, uh, we can only take a look at certain Psalms. Psalm 92 celebrates God's righteous rule in the earth. According to Psalm 93, the natural order remains secure because the Lord reigns. Psalm 94 is a call for God to avenge the wrongs done by wicked rulers against the weak. A call to worship. Psalm 95 was probably spoken to Israelites assembled in the temple. The attempt of Psalm 96 is to summon people of all nations to declare God's glory throughout the world. Psalm 97 is another psalm focusing on the Lord's reign in all the world. The composer of Psalm 98 pictures joy extended, extending in circles from the worshiping congregation to all the inhabitants of the earth to the whole creation. Psalm 99 represents God as the sovereign Lord of history, deserving reverence from his people. In Psalm 100, Israelites were urged to enter the temple to praise God. So, <clears throat> we still have just a little bit of time, and uh, if you need to go ahead and sign off, that's fine, but some of you might have a comment or a question. You could, again, type that in, and it'll appear on Trudy's screen, and she could read that to me. So I'll give you just a minute or two if anybody else does want to respond uh, any, in any way. But these are two of the most beautiful psalms, two of the psalms that are quoted very, very often by individuals, Psalm 90 and Psalm 91, where Psalm 23 is perhaps the best known of all the psalms. But these, again, are words of encouragement to hearts. Again, forgive me for my nose running. Again, all these uh, heaters and furnaces are getting to my nose, and then we had a candle burning that smelled really good, but I think it kind of got my nose going here as well. So, we're not seeing any comments or questions appearing on the screen. So, what we plan to do is go ahead and sign off. And then right about 11 o'clock, we're going to sign on again. And basically, I'm just going to make a couple little announcements, uh, ask for prayer again, and then go right into our study of, of the book of Matthew. We're not going to have a full worship service as far as music or videos or, or things like that are concerned because we are limited uh, using just uh, Trudy's phone as a camera. So... Mark says, the name Most High God was used by evil spirits. Ah, so they recognized God as the Most High God. It's probably what he's referring to there. Right, there are different names for God uh, in the Bible. And uh, you can talk to Patty. I don't know if we still have this book in our library or not. He said, why was to your response? Mark said, why? Because they, they understood the nature of who God is. You know, the book of James says that even the devils believe, even the demons believe uh, in God, even the demons believe that Jesus is the Son of God. We have evidence in the Gospels. Uh, for instance, remember the uh, gathering demoniac, where the uh, demons there plead with Jesus, you know, so at least send us into these, uh, these, uh, these pigs. So I think that they were acknowledging uh, that God is powerful. Remember back in those days, uh, human beings believed in what is called polytheism. They believed in many gods, and they believed in the local god of a local territory. The, the difference in scripture was that there is one true God, and he is almighty, he's all powerful. And so even the evil spirits uh, were recognizing that. Anyway, what I started to say was that uh, if you talk to Patty, we used to have a book in our library by Nathan Stone entitled The Names for God, and it breaks down a whole list of the different names that are used for God. In that situation, it is basically the Tetragrammaton, which is the Y-H-W-H, -H, that can be translated 
Jehovah, Yahweh, Yehovah, many different ways. But anyway, then added to that is another name or phrase that talks about how God works in our lives. But again, there's, there's many different names for God in the Bible. El is the basic Hebrew root for God. But then uh, we have different, different ones. And again, what I mentioned to you is if you have an English Bible and you're reading through the Old Testament, if you see Lord, capital L, and then small O-R-D, that probably is the Hebrew word Adonai, which is referring to just the Lordship. But if you come across a Lord that is capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, then that represents this tetragrammaton, which is the specific name that God gave to Moses and uh, as to who he is. And that's a very covenantal uh, relationship, a very covenantal name. Interestingly enough, um, I was watching a video the other day on uh, some of the archaeological uh, excavations that prove the Bible is true. And one of them is a stone that was found etched in a pharaoh's tomb that refers to this YHWH, this Yahweh, or Yehovah, or Jehovah, as the God of Israel. Well, that's interesting because that name was not given to uh, the Israelites until it was given to Moses, and uh, that was the time of the Exodus. So. He said they had no other relationship with him other than the all-powerful. He was the all-powerful, exactly. They didn't know him as we know him. All right, we're going to sign off, and again, around 11 o'clock, we'll see you. Thanks for joining us. Oh, my nose. <laughs>